Hello, my name is Kishmani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishmani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving GRE math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. We have finished solving almost all the problems from this book. If there is any problem at all that gives you difficulty, and if you wish to watch the solution to it, you will find the solutions to almost all the problems from this book from day number 251 through 400. From 251 through 400. This book, the second edition, happens to contain almost the same problems and in most cases appearing on exactly the same page numbers as the ones that appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. We are finished doing all the problems from this book, the first edition. In the event that you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find all the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Day 1 through 250. Right now, we are in the process of solving some quantitative comparison questions. Quantitative comparison questions, as you know, are a significant part of the exam. They are a big chunk of the exam. They have not gone away. Unfortunately, the newer books do not provide us with sufficient practice problems. For that reason, we began solving quantitative comparison questions from this book here, the 10th edition of the General GRE from day number 401. Today is our day number 469. This book contains seven exams. Each contains seven exams. Each exam has 30 questions in it for a total of 210 quantitative comparison questions. The series is going to end tomorrow. Today is our penultimate day. We spend 10 days per, per, per exam, per test, and therefore there are going to be 70 videos. Today is our penultimate day, as I said. Please turn to page number, please turn to page number 375. That's where we are. The very first problem on the page, problem number 11. Problem number 11. It's a geometry question. We're given a rectangle here. A rectangle that looks like a rectangle that actually looks like a rectangle. We are told that this is x. We are told that this is x plus 6. And what we are being asked to compare, what we are being told is that the number 11 is what it is. 61% of the 61% of people who took the exam had no trouble with it. What we are being told is that the perimeter perimeter of of the square s we are told is equal to is equal to the perimeter of the of the rectangle shown. So this rectangle that is shown to us, we are told that the, that the square in question, square s, which, which we have to plot ourselves, the perimeter of that square is the same as the perimeter of this guy, and what we are being asked to compare is this. In column A, we have the length of the side of square s versus column B, which is x plus 3. x plus 3. Let's see what we can do here. I'm going too much of a slow, uh, leisurely pace here. Let, let's squeeze this in here. Column, column B. Let's put it here. Column B. x plus 3. Let's see what we can do here. So, so the perimeter of this guy is the same as the perimeter of square. Perimeter of a square we know. If you have a square, the perimeter is just going to be 4 times each side. If you have a square here, obviously, each side, let's call it S here. And the perimeter of the square is going to be 4 times the S. And that perimeter, we are told, is the same as the perimeter of this guy. This is X and this is X, so that's 2X. And this is going to be X plus 6 and this is X plus 6, so this is going to be 2 times X plus 6. That's it, we are done. Let's divide the entire equation by 2. If we divide the entire equation by, by 2, well, we end up with 2s equals x plus... Well, let's, let's, first, let's first combine them actually. I, I was too hasty. Let's put them together. 2x, 2x plus 2x plus 12 and that is 4x plus 12 and that equals 4 times each, each to the side. That's it. Divide the entire, entire equation by 4. 
divide the entire equation by 4, if we divide the entire equation by 4, what we find is that s equals x plus 3. Voila, x right here. The side of the square, the side of the square which is column A, the side of the square which is column A, we just found out equals x plus 3 which is column B. And therefore the answer is C. Therefore the answer is C. I forgot to remind you to stop the video, to pause the video, to solve it yourself. Hopefully you will do it in the next one. You must pause the video every time, even if I don't remind you. Pause the video, solve the problem yourself, and then compare your work against the work that we do together. Number 12. Number 12. Number 12, we are told, number 12, about half the people, about half the people got it right, 47%, 53% of the people who took this particular exam missed it. Here's what we are told. We are told that 0 is less than A, which, is, which in turn is less than B, which in turn is less than C. And what we are being asked to compare in column A, we have, in column A, we have B, And in column A, or rather in column A we have B, and in column B we have, just give me one second, C. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, let's see what we can do. I need the room obviously, we're going to have to erase everything. B versus C. B versus C. Sorry, B over A, B over A versus C over B, versus C over B. That's it. I have the problem now on the blackboard the way it's supposed to be. I'm going to, I'm going to give you five seconds to pause and unpause the video. I actually do want you to solve it yourself first and see what you can do. Of course, B versus C would have been a stupid question. They tell you B is less than C. What the hell was I thinking? I'll give you five seconds to pause the video, okay? Here we go. Half the people missed the question. Obviously, there is something going on here that, uh, that's, uh, that about half the people uh, did not manage to see it. And the reason why they don't, don't manage to see it, why they messed it up, is because they leave the questions in the form that is given to you. Simplify it. I don't, I don't like dealing with the fractions. Let's multiply both sides by B. Let's multiply both sides by B. When we multiply both columns by B, which we can do, which, which, which we are allowed to do, why? Because we are told that 0 is less than a, which is this, thing, this thing that we see here is same as saying if a is greater than 0. If a is greater than 0, they are all positive numbers. a is greater than 0 and b is greater than a and c is greater than b, which means they are all positive numbers. And since we know that b is positive, it's perfectly okay for us to multiply both columns by a positive number. We cannot multiply or divide the both columns by a negative number because that reverses the direction of the inequality. But we can most certainly multiply or divide both columns by a positive number, of course, as long as the number is the same on both sides. So let's multiply both columns by B. And if we do that, we can get rid of this B. We don't know have to deal with the bloody thing. Similarly, I see A at the bottom here. Let's multiply both columns by A. If we multiply both columns by A, we can get rid of this A. And what do we end up here? We end up with B times B, which is B squared, versus A times C. Question is, what can we do next? Well, there are a couple of things we can do. A couple of things we can do. One thing, of course, which most people are going to do is to simply plug in numbers. Plug in numbers if you like, anything that you like. Uh, how about how about two, three, and four? Two, three, and four. Two is less than three. Three is less than four. In which case, b squared is going to be three squared, and two times four, two times four is eight. And th in this case, the answer is going to be eight. But the question is, do we stop here? Do we stop here? The answer obviously is no, we do not stop here because we have to we have to contemplate all the possibilities. Because if we had stopped here, had we stopped here, had we been had we have if we had thought that we are done here, the, the claim we would have made here is that the claim we, we would have made here is that the quantity in column A is always greater. We do not know that yet. We do not know if the quantity in column A is always greater unless we try out the weird number, the nasty numbers. If you recall, many a times we have come across the situations where we have to plug in numbers and I always remind you, 
that don't just stop by plugging in nice numbers, you must always try the nasty numbers. Nasty numbers. Do you remember? Do you remember the list of the nasty numbers? This is this is our 69th day. Obviously, we come across this thing many times. Do you remember the list of nasty numbers? Nasty numbers. The nastiest of all is zero. If there is a chance where you can plug in a zero, try that always. Here we cannot try zero because we are told that all of these are greater than zero. So we cannot try zero. We are told that A is greater than zero, B is greater than zero. So zero is out. We can't try zero. The next nastiest number, do you remember? What's the next nastiest number that we want to try? The next one in the list is one. You must always go in this order. Don't go all over the place. Go in the exam. You have to remain systematic. That's how we save time. Can we try one? The answer is why not? Watch what happens. Watch what happens, okay? Watch what happens. Let's, for example, you can look and plug in anything that you want here. For example, you can plug in anything you want here. For example, as a matter of fact, a matter of fact I'm going to leave, leave the 3 here. Leave the 3 here, just the way it is. B, is, B squared is going to be 3 times B squared. Uh, actually, 3 is not going to work. We're talking about plugging in 1. I'm not thinking straight. Let's plug in 1 here. Let's plug in 1 here for B. Let's plug in 1 here for B. And what about A times C? Can we make that quantity 1 also? The answer is yes. Why not? Why not? There are infinite possibilities. There are infinite possibilities. As long as... Where can we write it? Where can I write it? As... As long as... As long as... A and C are reciprocal... A and C are reciprocal of each other... The answer is going to be C. The answer is going to be C. For example, for example, if if B is one, not if B is one, B is one. In which case, A A times C is what we're looking at. Let's erase this nice part. We no longer need the nice part. Let's just deal with the nasty parts. So we have B squared, which is going to be one because B is one. And here we have A times C. Maybe A is A is one over three and B is C. One over three and C is 3. Or maybe A is 1 over 10 and C is 10. You get the idea. There are infinite possibilities. There are infinite possibilities. And in all of these scenarios we satisfy the condition that A is more than 0 and, and A is more than 0 and B is more than A and C is more than B. All of this is 1 tenth, 1 and 1, 1 hundred. As I said, there are, there are infinite possibilities. It's not just one or two possibilities. As long as, as long as A and C are going to be reciprocal, their product is going to be, their, their product is going to be 1. Their, if A and C are reciprocal, you're going to get A, or A times C, which is going to be same as, which is going to be same as A times 1 over A. And of course, their product is going to be 1. This is 1 and this is 1. This is one because we have we plugged in one here. This this is fixed. This doesn't change. Try plugging in one if you can. And if that doesn't work, then we try the negative numbers. And if negative number doesn't do not work, then we try the, the fractions. But the negative and fractions we save until the very end and we plug them in only when it's absolutely necessary. In most cases, you can get away by just looking at the uh, scenario of zero and one. Simply ask yourself what happens if one of this is if one of these variables is zero. What happens if one of these variables is 1? What happens if they are all 0? What happens if they are all equal to 1? And that's all. In most cases, you can simply get away with that. Do you understand? Of course, they cannot be all equal to 1, because here we have a condition here that they are not equal to 1. They cannot all be equal, but sometimes they are allowed to be equal to 1. Do you understand? If they simply tell you that A and B are positive numbers and they stop at that, well, then why not? They can both be 1. They can both be anything they want to be. They can be equal, of course, each to each other. In, in, enough said. Let's do number 13. Problem number 13. Problem number 13. Problem number 13 when it appeared in the exam. 61% of people got it right. 61% had no trouble. We are told that we have a circle C. C is a circle with a radius of with the radius with the radius of three. C is a circle we are told with the radius of three. Here's our column A. Column A says the ratio of the ratio of the circumference 
of C to the diameter of C versus column B which is 3. I'll give you 5 seconds to pause and unpause the video, do the problem yourself first and then we'll do it together, okay? Okay, here we go. Before we look at the problem here, here's, here's, here's the question that I want to ask you. What's the definition of pi? Pi. What is the definition of pi? No, I'm not asking you what it equals to. Most of the times if you walk up to people and you ask them, what's the, what, if you simply ask them, what is pi? If you walk up to somebody and simply ask them, try it, ask them, walk up to somebody and ask them, what is pi? In most cases, in vast majority of cases, they will probably tell you it is 3.14. But that's not what the question is, that's not what I ask you. I'm not asking you how much it is, I'm not asking you how much it is, I'm asking you what is it? Can you explain conceptually what pi is? What is pi, do you know? Pi, conceptually, pi is simply, it is simply the ratio, pi is simply the ratio of distance, distance around a circle, over the distance across the circle. Whatever circle we're talking about, whichever circle that you chose, across that circle. For example, for example, here's our circle here. Pi, pi happens to be the ratio of distance around the circle, distance around the circle, what do we call that concept? Distance around the circle is what we call the circumference. Worse, uh, over distance across the circle. Here is our center, distance across the circle. What do, you call, what do we call this distance? Distance across the circle. Anywhere you like, distance across the circle. As across the circle means you go through the center here, this distance right here. What do we call this distance? Distance across the circle. Well, distance across the circle is the diameter. So what is a pi? pi is the ratio of circumference to the diameter. Pi, if somebody were to ask you next time, if somebody asks you what is pi, the answer is pi is simply a ratio of distance across the circle, rather distance around the circle to the decrease distance across the circle. It's a natural phenomenon. It's a natural phenomenon. It's a natural constant, just, just the way the universe was created. If you were to draw any circle at all, any circle at all, as long as it's a perfect circle, and if you were to measure the distance around it and divide that by distance across it, you will find that that ratio is always, always, always constant. And the person who made that discovery, he happened to name it, it was a Greek guy, he happened, he, he happened to name this ratio pi, pi for the Greek letter, for the Greek, for, for the Greek letter P. It's what we call in English language P. Why did he call it P? Why did he not call it R or Q or M or S or T? I don't know. Maybe his girlfriend's first, maybe his girlfriend's name began with the P. Or maybe his mother's name began with the P. How the hell do I know? He just named it P. Had he, had he named it Lambda, we would, we would have called it Lambda. Lambda is the letter L. Had he called it Alpha, had he called this concept Alpha, we would have, today we would refer to this concept as Alpha. The person who made the discovery, he named it P or Pi. That is Pi. Pi is the distance across the circle this, rather, this distance around the circle to the distance across the circle. What, is, what does this say here in column A? In column A it says the ratio of circumference of the circle to the diameter. We just found out that that is pi. We just found out that this ratio, this ratio right here, the circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle, circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle, we just found out that that is pi. And of course we know that it's more than 3. Of course we know it's more than 3. So this is our column A, column A has pi in it and column B has 3 in it. Of course pi is more than 3, the answer is A. They simply want to see here if you know the concept of pi, not what is it, but rather, uh, not how much is it rather, not how much is it, is it, but rather what is it. And if you knew that, you would have realized that in column A what we have here is pi, ratio of circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle is pi. That's where, actually, I was about to finish, I was about to finish uh, the, 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 the video, but
but I'm going to continue here a little bit. Watch what happens. Watch what happens, okay? What is the pi? What is the pi? Pi is the distance across the circle to distance around the uh, distance around the circle to distance across the circle. Watch what happens. Let's multiply both sides by d. <coughs> d cancels out, and c equals pi times d. And d, of course, and d, of course, is two times r, which of course can be written as two pi r. There you go. There is your there is your formula for circumference. Circumference equals two pi r. The formula for circumference embedded embedded in this formula is the definition of pi. That's where it comes from. The derivation the derivation of the formula for the circumference comes from the definition of pi. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.